Okay, so let's start. How many of you have put an odontoid screw? Okay, so this will be a, something different which you haven't done before, most of you. So if you have read the book, it says that the odontoid fractures are of three type. One is just the tip, which is very rare. I have maybe seen one till now. But the book says that this is the type one. Probably it's just the tearing off of the ligament on top with a small chip of bone. But this is a rare thing. The most common thing you see is at the neck because if you imagine this is the head of a person, this is the shoulder, then this is the neck. And that's why it's called the neck of the odontoid. If the fracture runs through here, it's type 2. And type 3 is more on the chest of this person. When it's gone through the body of C2, then it's type 3. And then different people have classified type 2 in different ways, A, B, etc. But basically you need to remember most things about this. Because this, usually the management is non-operative. You just give him a collar, it should be fine. This is also, <coughs> you need to stabilize the neck. Nine times out of ten, you don't need any surgery for this. So this is the one which can be tackled surgically. A lot of literature, odontoid fractures was in fashion about 15, 20 years ago. And a whole lot of people have published a whole lot, one screw, two screw, this way, that way. One thing is that the incidence has been rising. Maybe because we are getting more wheels, that's why we have more high-speed accidents. And that's why we have more fractures of the odontoid. Earlier, the management was also not good at the accident side. So more and more people are surviving and getting to the hospital in a better shape, getting investigated better. And that's the reason why we are picking up more of the odontoid fractures. Young, mostly motor vehicle accidents, mostly it's a hyperextension injury. Or the second bimodal peak is you see in old people, 80 years old, 85 years old. And as our population ages, we are going to see more and more of this. And this is going to be a problem because we don't know how to manage this. In an 80 year old with an odontoid fracture, what do you do? In children, it is less devastating because the ligaments are lax and you know generally that area can have more space and more tolerant to shifts. And so the results are very good, whether you fuse from the front or the back, the results are very good. Or if you don't fuse at all. So it seems that the fractures which happen more or less coincide with the embryology. Because if you remember the embryology, the tip of the odontoid process is from the fourth occipital sclerotome. So the first type of fracture, because this probably it fuses later, uh, it becomes solid bone much later, so the fracture can occur here. The rest of the dense is from the second cervical sclerotome, this one. And there are five ossification centers and the whole thing fuses by about seven years. So you must remember these things. You know the vasculature, anterior and posterior descending arteries around the odontoid process. They are perforators from the carotid. And because these vessels get disrupted, there are very high non-union rates. What if you don't do anything? What will happen is there will be non-union. And non-union can be a cause of continuous or intermittent but disabling pain in the neck. So to get over that, somebody thought, why not fuse it? And that's how the operations for the odontoid process fractures became to be popular. So we have gone through this. So A and B is basically anterior and posterior of type 2. We have been through this, how to fix. Type 2 is the one where there is some controversy, whether you need to reduce and fix anteriorly or reduce and put a halo. Do you excise the odontoid if it has gone back and it is not reducing? Or you do a posterior fixation. But type 3, usually you can get around the surgery by putting a halo and waiting till the body fuses. So before the 80s, not many people were operating on the odontoid fractures. And in 92, Apfelbaum was one of the earliest ones to report actually the anterior odontoid screw fixation. And he said it's the better way. You can immediately mobilize the patient. There's no need for a collar and everything is fine. And he published a big series, I think 160 cases or something like that. So what happens if you don't put a screw or don't stabilize it? The risk of failure is 21 times higher than surgery in patients more than 50 years. That was what was seen. What this means is non-union. And non-union means continuous pain or maybe some other problems if it is mobile. And this was published in 2000. Then came the controversy about whether you should put one screw or two screws. But it has now been almost conclusively proved that one screw is as good as two. And in most part of the world, the odontoid is not as big that it can take two screws. And biomechanically, it is proved that it, one screw is, works as well as two. So the fusion rates as well as stability is almost the same. There is no difference. And technically, putting one screw is easier because the odontoid thickness is not much. 
all these things we can discuss but we are going to concentrate on the anterior screw fixation the most important advantage of this anterior screw fixation is that it gives immediate stabilization the two pieces separate you put a lag screw how many of you are from uh, have got any touch with orthopedics do you know what a lag screw is so it's not a fully threaded screw so the first part of the screw is like a nail and it's only the tip which has got threads so the theory behind it is that the distal fragment is caught by the threads and the nail gets it together that's the purpose of a lag screw so apple bomb was an orthopedic surgeon or he was heavily trained in orthopedics if not a i think he was professor of both orthopedics and neurosurgery but he had a big orthopedic training and that's how he said okay lag screw is what we need in this and so if you put a lag screw then you reduce the fracture it keeps the whole thing together and it gives immediate stabilization that's the biggest advantage of an anterior screw fixation and the second advantage is that it's easier than the posterior c1c2 fixation we have just he just spoke about posterior fixations you have to keep track of whole lot of things the vertebral artery the root the cord anteriorly the but here anterior screw fixation it's much less complicated than putting a c1c2 fixation from the back so we can skip all this we know this high failure rates if you conserve and look at the difference in the fusion rates 40% is the lowest here the lowest is 90% so it definitely fuses you have to assess whether fusion is the treatment you want as long as fusion is the treatment you want then anterior is better you giving you better fusion rates so which one to do anterior posterior we know the disadvantages of posterior surgery we have just been through that but still if you cannot reduce the fracture if the odontoid fracture cannot be reduced the two pieces do not come in an anatomical position then you cannot do an anterior screw and then you have to do something posteriorly to stabilize and we have been through those procedures what you can do so reducibility is a sign corner for anterior odontoid screw you must be able to get it in position if you cannot then you should not attempt an anterior odontoid screw which patients to do so all patients with type 2 odontoid fractures provided the fracture is fresh why is that 3 months the freshness of the bone is gone and if it's a hard bone if it's a cortical bone it's not going to fuse so then your screw is going to break every screw will fail if it doesn't fuse remember that every screw will break if it doesn't fuse and if you put in a screw in a fracture which is old which has got cortical bone or there's some soft tissue stuck you know many times there's a soft tissue fibrosis growing between the two fractured ends then your screw is not going to heal the fracture it's going to break whatever you can get i don't believe in one thing two things three things whatever radiology you can get in a patient please get it mri is no radiation apart from a little bit of money and if your hospital can afford it get an mri in every patient you'll at least know what's happening to the cord inside but orthopedic people you know they are very reluctant to get an mri done for some strange reason but we should you should know what is happening in and around that whole area including the cord in that area or the cervical medullary junction we have been through this anterior and posterior so here is an example you can see the fracture so this part has gone anteriorly and that's how this is the one which is causing the pressure now so if you cannot reduce it you cannot put a screw the odontoid screw is supposed to go from here to the top of odontoid your odontoid is here so you obviously cannot put a odontoid screw in this case unless it reduces so you pull you give traction you extend his neck you do whatever maneuver you think is right depending upon the nature of the fracture to try and get it in line unless it is in line you can't put a screw even this is not perfectly in line so this is not perfect for an odontoid screw because the screw will start somewhere here and it will go this way so it will take very little portion of the distal fragment and your screw is going to fail this is not an ideal position for putting a screw why is it so because look at the fracture in the cross section it's an oblique it's placed more on one side it's an oblique thing so your screw is not going to work here so you must be very careful and look at the anatomy of the fracture and decide whether your screw is going to do the job or not now sometimes it moves back like in this patient the odontoid has moved back if you see the c2 body is somewhere here and this whole thing has moved back and the c1 is shifted back so again reduction if you don't reduce it your screw is going to hang in mid air go into soft tissue somewhere here so reduction is important once you reduce it once you get it in a nice position then you can put a screw properly 
another thing is that you need two x-rays you know you need to keep looking at the screw where it's going in an ap as well as in a lateral direction so it becomes a little fiddly so you have very little space to stand the surgeon the assistant there's the traction there the endotracheal tube and all the paraphernalia of the anesthetist on top of that you have these two x-ray machines so sometimes it can be tricky but if you have only one machine even then it can be done you keep shifting between ap and lateral and then the surgery becomes longer because you, every time you need to change to lateral ap lateral ap so it's difficult to reproduce the exact image again and again few centimeters the machine shifts you may not get the same image again so that's the trouble so it's best done with two x-ray machines which is difficult in many operation theaters have uh, all of your operation theaters do they have two x-ray machines so with one machine it's very difficult to do that you will spend a lot of time looking at ap and lateral again and again and just moving the x-ray machine and by the time you're through you're so tired and you're sick of the whole thing that you don't want to do odontoid screw ever again but if you have two machines then it's it's nice so that's what you should do so you must look at the ct x-ray mri everything carefully to decide whether this screw this is what i mean by the lag screw you see only the tip has threads and the rest of it is a nail and that's how this tip pulls the distal fragment towards it reduces the gap between the two fractures and that's how it's going to hold it in opposition because fusion needs tension if there is no tension between the two pieces it's not going to fuse it needs to be opposed that's where you begin so you might have to remove a little bit of disc anteriorly between c2 and c3 so that the head of your screw goes into the disc space like that. and you see the angle that's the angle so uh, all this is soft tissue here so just imagine where your skin incision is going to be this is 2 3 4 5 or 6 maybe so your skin incision or where your angle touches the skin is going to be at c5 6 so that's where you should begin that's where your incision should be that's where your exposure should be and you should start dissecting from there you go up till you get to this c23 disc space then you'll give a small incision in the disc remove some part of the disc so that you create a space for the screw head to lodge so it should not protrude out because that's where the the trachea esophagus everything is here so it's going to obstruct if it if you start here the screw is going to project to the soft tissue here that's not good it should lodge inside the disc space so to get that angle you need to begin lower down and it depends upon each patient so you'll have to do an x ray on the table place a metal instrument in this angle and see where your skin incision is going to be and that's where to begin so that's where uh, it should be right in the middle now what's wrong in this one it doesn't seem to be reduced there i don't know i can't see properly but there's probably still a gap over there and second thing wrong the yeah the head of the screw is not inside the disc space it's lodged here third thing which is wrong it's not taken the anterior cortex i can still see the anterior cortical line here or probably here so there are many things wrong in this screw but still it is probably one of the earliest ones you see i don't think this machine exists in our ot now so this must this x ray must be at least 15 years old we were very happy because the thing fused ultimately and the patient was fine but there are so many things wrong in this so this i always put this to make sure that you know where things can go wrong the result may be good but it's not a good it's not a well placed odontoid screw the head is not in the proper position the tip is not in the proper position and the lag effect is not there because your threads are still straddling the fractured part that is the most important thing why the gap between the fracture is not reduced because the whole lag effect has not come this screw needed to be longer and the tip should have been somewhere here so we looked some of our patients we did it in 80 years but now it's a controversy people believe that maybe it should not be done but still usually it doesn't cause much problem odontoid fracture patients come with just the complaint of cervical pain most of them don't have any neurological problem most of them because eight of our patients did have quadriparesis and that's why the mri becomes important if you have an odontoid fracture patient with complaining of neurology you must get an mri done and see because most of the times odontoid fracture should not be causing any neurological thing unless there is a contusion inside or some injury inside so most of them were one month i mean we get late we get patients referred from everywhere and if they are intact they have to wait in line so that's why the delay but the earlier you can do the better it is and the cut off usually taken is 3 months if it is more than 3 months it's wiser not to attempt an anti odontoid screw it will fail so earlier we didn't have two x rays in our theater so the first 11 odontoid screws we did with i did with only one x ray and it was a big headache it was a big headache but then finally we had two x rays and then it was much easier 
and then we had image guided also but i have frankly i have never used image guided but nowadays uh, these guys use image guided for practically everything so what do you use is a single earlier ones we used steel screws lag screws because the titanium screws were not available i think the first screw i did when the titanium lag screw was not available so i used the stainless steel lag screw 4 mm diameter in the first 11 patients and now you have all these things the cannulated stuff available you can do it percutaneous so that the guide wire then tracks everything the your drill goes through goes over your tap goes over that and the screw also goes over the guide wire so things become much more easier so this can probably be done with a tube this is one of the surgeries which can be done with a tube and there are some reports available which they have done with a tube so no need to make a big incision and do a lot of dissection usually there are no complications most of the patients don't have any problem except for the people who have been injured who have a cord contusion or a cord injury before so they may <coughs> continue with that process most of the patients one was lost to follow but 37 all of them showed good fusion including the one in which the screw was badly placed so it's a forgiving surgery as long as you get the two things in proximity as close to each other as possible most of them will fuse and provided they are fresh in one patient a posterior fixation had to be done because of persistent atlantoaxial dislocation despite good fusion of the odontoid odontoid fused but the atlantoaxial dislocation can you think of a reason why that could happen so that's another reason why you must get an mri done no other thing will tell you about the ligament injury except an mri and this is what happened i think the earlier ones we did not have an mri and then this fellow he actually still had aad the odontoid fused but he still had atlantoaxial dislocation because the traction got it in place the screw went fine the odontoid fused but aad persisted immediate direct fixation preserves the normal mobility c1 c2 mobility is maintained high rates of fusion and immediate improvement of cervical pain which is because of the moving bone pieces so here this screw seems to be better but still it could have been even better i think a couple of turns more and it should have been better and this we can't see it very clearly but i guess it's reached the top another one seems to have reached the top or seems to have reached the cortex at the back so fairly in the midline fairly well placed you can see it till the last cut which they showed us i think the one cut above it did not show the screw so it it stopped somewhere here but it's gone through the fracture segment and the threaded part is beyond so it worked so this was the oldest patient we did 80 years old he had a fracture the screw is slightly tilted it's gone off to one side but i think the it straddles the fracture line and the distal part the threaded part is beyond the fracture line so it worked very well and he is the gentleman 3 days after surgery and he was fine and later on the odontoid fracture fused so everything worked out well so this is just a brief overview of the odontoid the obliquity of the fracture is also important that is i think it's common sense if you can see that your screw is going to push the distal fragment away the fracture is in such a way that the moment you touch the distal fragment it is going to push so it's dangerous but you can get around that it's not very difficult to get around that you can put a finger in the mouth you can actually push the odontoid and keep it there till you get it across the fracture and get it into the cortex on the other side and once you do that there's no need or you can use a sponge holder one used for cleaning put a sponge around the sponge holder put it in the open mouth and press the odontoid and see on the x-ray whether that is helping your direction or not there are two or three things you can do